and welcome to Shorten House's own Gardener's Question Time. Um, I'm Katie, the Chief Executive, and uh, Julia, our gardener, here is going to um, answer some of the questions um, that we have been sent um, via social media over the week before the Shorten House Garden Festival. Now, Julia, we've got we've got quite a lot of questions um to to get through which i'm really relieved because otherwise you would you would just be looking at plants in my flat here um with me going what's wrong with this <laughs> um, <laughs> so i'm delighted that so many um of our uh, virtual visitors um have got questions uh, questions to ask you and this this is really an extension of of what your real life is in the garden with with people asking you questions about Chorton House and uh, uh, and about their own plants as well so hopefully in the course of the next um, little while we'll answer a few questions that people who've been home during lockdown um, are eager to know the answers uh, whilst they've been whilst they've been looking after their own gardens. Yes, it's been a bit of a challenge, some of the questions, I have to say. Um, my experience in the UK hasn't um, stretched to North Carolina normally, but um, there's been some really nice questions from there. So I've done a little bit of research, so hopefully we can uh, give some good responses to those. But yes, our climate is slightly different, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Even though it's so hot and dry at the moment, um, I don't think we match what's over there. <laughs> No, it is beautiful weather whilst we're recording this. And Julia is in her um, in her gardener's office at Chawton, um, and I'm at, I'm at home in London. So uh, yeah, Julia is the one on site at the minute. So shall we shall we crack on with the first question that we um, yeah. that we got asked? And I and I think this is something that quite a few people during lockdown will have been doing. Um, and so the question was, I have just constructed a raised bed in a sheltered sunny spot. Can you suggest what vegetables to plant in it now? OK, so um, basically I'm making suggestions for the UK, uh, just in case we do have some American visitors uh, watching this. Um, and June is actually a good time still to plant some vegetables. Um, we could be growing beetroot. Um, you can sow some at the beginning of the month and some at the end of the month, which will give you varying sizes uh, when you come to harvest um, towards the end of the summer. Carrots, it's last chance now for, har um, for harvesting in September and October, so get your carrots in. Um, lots of lovely varieties out there, watch out for carrot fly, obviously. Um, salad crops goes without saying here in the UK we do like to grow our lettuce um, cut and come again varieties are really good radishes in small amounts <clears throat> French beans um, can get those in now runner beans everybody loves a runner bean they they're really good because they crop into October um, right up to the frosts um, and they will freeze as well so you can get some over the winter um, Herbs, always good to have some herbs that you can just drop in a recipe here and there, um, such as coriander, basil and parsley. Um, but you do need to be careful at the moment of the high temperatures because they may not germinate. So let's hope for a bit of cooler weather just through the, the weeks that are coming up and then you'll see some more um, herbs in your garden. Excellent. There's plenty to be getting on with, uh, plenty to be getting on with there. Um, so and, and this is uh, the second question is actually something we've done similarly at Chawson but um, we were asked five years ago I planted three very young apple trees together they are in the shade of a large oak tree and beech tree and have failed to produce any apples in the last five years and this year isn't looking good either have you got any suggestions? Okay, so it's quite difficult to make um, a good prognosis without seeing the actual site um, because there are a number of number of factors that could affect this. Um, they do like to be in a sunny spot and quite sheltered. Um, and I think sunny is the key um, part of that. Um, they don't like poorly drained and shallow soils. Um, which leads me to believe that they're possibly planted in the wrong place because the larger trees, uh, the oak and the beech, could be competing for water, light and nutrients. The other um, possibility is that they're not compatible. 
with apple trees, they all have pollination groups. And so they, yeah, they cross pollinate each other. And it's quite important to check when you're buying them that they will cross pollinate with the, one, the ones that you've bought with the ones that you already have. Um, so it could be um, that that's a problem. It, it isn't specified in the question whether they're actually blossoming or not. Um, so that's another possibility. So the solution to that is, well, there's a, there's a couple of things to do. As the trees are five years old, it's difficult to move them at this point because they've got their feet into the ground. Um, so the first thing is check the varieties to see that they do cross pollinate. Clear away the weeds and grass from the base if there is any mulch in the autumn, water them regularly. Um, and you could, and this, I would really get advice on this, you could actually um, remove some of the canopy from the beach or the oak to allow more light in, but that is a real extreme solution. The easiest thing to do is to buy some new trees and locate them in a more sunny spot, checking the pollination times. Excellent. Yeah, they're big trees, beaches and oaks, aren't they? They are going to take, take up water and take up light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if they're all too close together, then there's ju just too much competition. Yeah. Um, I really like this question um, because it's a piece of work that we have started um, at Chawton House um, fair, well, are starting quite recently. Um, but the question is, I'm relatively new to gardening and not a particularly skillful gardener. But the question that's relevant is any suggestions on how I construct a compost heap? Yeah, we've done exactly the same here, actually. We've had to construct because of coming in, obviously, earlier in the year and trying to set up various parts of the garden. Um, and I knew there was a lot to cut down. I've had to construct a very quick compost heap. Um, and then, <laughs> and then and we need to a bijou compost heap, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. We really needed something much bigger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the quickest, cheapest and easiest method is using pallets. Um, you just get four pallets of the same size. Um, if they're narrow slatted, it's a, it's a bit better because then the compost won't fall through the slats as it starts to break yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's good. And a flat piece of ground, obviously, otherwise it's going to be a bit um, rickety. Um, so find yourself some ground which is level, all level it, obviously, if you haven't got level ground, um, and use a soil base rather than a concrete or paving slab base. It just allows the worms to navigate their way up and down um, and for the moisture to go through the compost as well, rather than just collecting at the bottom. Um, and all you really need are the um, pallet, four pallets, and then wire or rope to tie them together. Um, and then you might need a, a spare pair of hands just to help you because <laughs> you just construct a box shape. So you tie the corners, the, the three corners, and then you can just hinge the front part of it so you can open it to wheel your barrow in and drop your compost in and get, or when it's rotted down, wheel your barrow in and take your compost out. Um, so try to pull it in from the top and um, yeah sometimes you've got loads of material and you're just throwing it over the top you know it, it goes over the sides and, <laughs> anyway um yeah but pallets that i would i would suggest is the easiest way excellent and you can pick up pallets well very cheaply but probably free in most cases certainly um in the uk because the, the people are trying to get rid of them rid of yeah. them all the time there's two on on my neighbor's drive right at the minute yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> very green as well there's no exactly. plastic involved exactly um so uh, we mentioned that we'd had some questions from um, from our friends in uh, North America and specifically North Carolina. Um, and so uh, this one is, uh, as I said, it's very hot in the UK for us at the moment. Um, but what's the best heat tolerant climbing rose? We live in North Carolina where it's very humid and hot in the summer. Yeah, so this was a, a question that I had to do some investigating around, um, which was interesting. Um, and the basic idea about the humidity is that when there's high humidity, the roses will bring moisture in through their leaves and they may not need extra watering. So where 
over here we would probably water um, and add extra mulch to make sure that that water was retained at the, the base of the plant. Um, it's probably slightly different in North Carolina. And the best thing there is just to keep an eye on them and water them if they look a bit droopy. Um, but I did research it and I found three roses that were recommended. Um, one of which is called New Dawn, which is one we can get in the UK as well. Um, and we did grow this at Polston Lacey where I worked previously. It's a lovely rose and it's one of the oldest um, and most widely grown of the climbing roses. It was introduced in 1930 um, and it's got large silvery pink flowers which are about eight centimetres across. It can grow up to about two and a half metres. Um, flowers early summer to late summer and it thrives in hot, humid conditions um, and is recommended, um, as I say, in uh, North Carolina. Um, another one is called Fourth of July. Appropriate. Oh, very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is, uh, it's a red and white stripe rose. It's quite a modern rose. It's only been around for a couple of decades. Um, and I think it was specially developed. Um, it's very vigorous and it did win the All America Rose Selection Award. Um, so that's, that's why I mentioned that best. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then the third one is something, um, it's a plant called Zephyrine Druham, which I'd not heard of. And it, again, specifically mentioned for North Carolina. And it's a bourbon style rose. So it's got lots of petals, very blousy. Um, and it's got deep. Uh, candy pink flowers and it's got really nice fragrance as well um, and this was created in 1868 um, by the French rose grower Bizo. Uh, it's tolerant of part shade and poor soils and it is available in both the US and the UK. That sounds beautiful. Um, yes. Um, your notes, I do have some of your notes here, it also says it's thornless as well which um, those of us who don't like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> lacerating our hands that sounds um, that sounds like an excellent idea yeah. um oh i think both me and my sister would um would appreciate the next question um i have cuttings from my parents hydrangea bushes which are growing nicely and i'm keen not to kill them off um my partner and i are house hunting so i'm reluctant to plant them in the ground at our house only to try and move them again soon so if i put them in pots will they be okay in the winter or do i need to do anything special to them so hydrangeas will grow in pots, which is really good news. So there's no panic. You don't have to get them into <laughs> the ground and then dig them back out again. And they are quite happy in a pot. Um, just make sure you choose one that's a nice size. It might be slightly bigger than the root ball that you've already got. Um, and you need to leave about um, a few centimetres at the top of the pot to make sure that you can water them. Um, because in a container, they'll dry out quite quickly. Um, and when you water, you fill, fill it to the brim, let the water soak through and then give it another water and let the water soak through. And that makes sure that the soil is nice and wet um, and damp. And then keep them in a spot where they get full sun in the morning and some shade in the afternoon. Um, and they'll stay in the pot. And then you can just take the pot with you. And when you get to your new house, you can even keep them in the pot if you want to, or you can put them in the ground. It's entirely up to you. And we have some, well, we we discovered some hydrangeas in pots at, at Chorton, which seem to be growing quite happily. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, something, uh, something that works very well. Um, so next question. Um, I'm going to be moving to Norfolk this year, all being well, says our questioner, not me. Um, and the house we're buying has the biggest garden I've ever had. It's pretty boring at the moment. What are your recommended books for a garden planning newbie? So this is quite a big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> recommended books is always very difficult um, because it depends really on the type of garden that you want to have. So my suggestion really is, and this is the basic premise of looking at garden design, is you need to really think about what you want to have in the garden. What are you going to use the garden for? 
so that you can think about do you want hard landscaping where do you want the hard landscaping do you want a patio do you want decking do you want a pond is it going to be used um, by children because you may want to have a play area are you going to use it for a lot of entertaining um, so there's a lot of questions around the functionality first of all um, and then um, the big thing that actually affects what you can grow is your your soil and the aspect of the garden so you can only grow certain plants in certain soils so there's no point designing a garden full of plants that are not going to grow there <laughs> so, um, so it's, that's why I say it's quite a big subject um, my suggestion is to actually you could look at garden designers specific garden designers that you like um, and see how they design their gardens you can visit gardens and take oh. ideas from those to take back to your own garden then once you've sort of got the rough idea of what you want you can then look for design books from people that you like, from styles of gardens that you like. You could go to an evening class. Um, I did an evening class a few years ago, literally for six weeks or so, that just gave me the basic information on how to design a, a garden. Um, and then, I mean, there are no rules as such, but it's about taking all the information and then sifting it through and deciding what you want to do. Um, you know, sometimes they say rules are made to be broken. Well, <laughs> you know, you, you can do that. Um, but just remember, you know, that the plants themselves do like certain situations. So really, they're going to guide um, what you can put in where. Um, I have very little expertise whoever, to the person who asked this question, but I'm, I moved into this house and the garden still is, um, but it's a, a, the house uh, renovation, the garden's the last project. And I'm a complete garden newbie as well, because I've never had a garden before. So, um, but similarly, I went and visited other gardens. Um, I think gardening magazines, rather than investing in, in sort of big... Yeah books and um, because then you'll get a lots of different ideas and um, so a subscription to a to some sort of gardening magazine um, I think can be quite helpful as well because then you can work out what to do and um, although the best advice that that I was given was would live in your house for a little bit first and then you can understand things like where um, where where the which parts of the garden catch the sun um, how often you, you're going to going to use it and as you say the different usages um, and then you can sort of work rather than getting cracking straight away you can sort of work out what might or might not grow um, and do well in particular in your particular garden. Yeah and the other tip that I was given is look around at the neighbours gardens yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because if they can grow azaleas and rhododendrons then so can you but if there's not one in sight for like you know the, the, all the all down the street then there's no point <laughs> even attempting it unless you want to put it in a container. Um, <laughs> But the other thing that, that's quite helpful is if you uh, look at the RHS website, they have do have a list of recommended books um, on garden design. And also there's um, the Oxford College of Garden Design lists some really good books and they do some good courses. Um, so, um, yeah, have a look around at those as well. Yeah, definitely the visiting gardens is um, it's a definitely a way of thinking you're doing your garden without actually getting into the work. Um, so I really need to move into doing the work now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the next the next mm -hmm. question is quite um, quite a big question, um, because I imagine there are different ways to do this. And it's something we do do a bit at Chorton. But how do you go about espaliering trees? OK, so um, this question is quite general. Um, the phrase espaliering trees can mean so many things. Um, in the normal gardening sense, we would espalier fruit trees, so things like apples, pears, cherries, etc. Um, For the real gardening newbies, Julia, this is to explain espaliering, it's, it's how you grow yeah. along um, yeah. a, a, like a fence or a, or a wall, isn't it? So you grow horizontally yeah. rather than vertically. Yeah. Yeah, so you would essentially buy um, what's called a maiden plant um, 
which you would start from to do your espalier, which will allow you, as you've just said, to as it grows up, then wire in each branch as it goes across. Um, and then you get higher and higher until you get to a point where you don't want to grow up anymore. Um, so it's it's usually a three or four tiered tree, fruit tree, ordinarily. Um, and then it's likely that the bottom espaliers will be fruiting before the top ones um, as it grows up. Um, so And as each tier is created, then those below will be producing side shoots, which need to be summer pruned. Um, so it's really important to have um, formative, what they call formative training. So you're starting from, from the whip or the maiden, um, and then you can, you've can you got a good start, basically. I've not done this myself, so I know we've got some in our um, walled garden, um, which are all, have been there for quite a while, and they're wonderful. They look really lovely. They're a really good way of using space in the garden um, without, you know, encroaching into garden space itself, you know, using the wall or a fence. Yeah, we um, valued apple trees, I think, aren't they? In the yeah, yeah. yeah. But they do take a number of years um, to grow um, and it's always recommended to go to a reputable nursery to get the stock for it as well because you need the right stock you don't want anything that's going to grow huge yeah. and it sounds um, like a lot of work so buy the right thing at the at the starts and it will make yeah. it you know, make yeah. it worthwhile I mean the, the only other plant that I can think of that you would do this is something like a pyracantha where you're putting this against a wall at, outside the front of a house maybe yeah. Um, or along a wall, along a garage or something, where you could do a similar thing. Um, but in terms of tree, generally trees, are, I mean, again, rules are made to be broken. Give it a go. <laughs> 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 we can try it. Maybe um, four years' time, someone sends us a picture of a, a completely unusual tree, as valid. Um, yes. that's, not, that's not an apple tree. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, it's certainly one of the... Um, one of the things that we we have quite a big garden volunteer team at Chorton and and we have expertise across the across the volunteers as well as um, as well as Julia's and some some are our experts on fruit trees. Um, the next uh, question is uh, is a tree question as well. Um, and again, another one that fits very well with our, our walled garden, because our walled garden has a, an enormous mm. fig tree in one corner of it, a huge fig tree <laughs> in one corner of it. Um, so this question is very simply, what are your tips for pruning fig trees? Again, I haven't I haven't pruned a fig tree before, so I saw the size <laughs> of this one in the walled garden and I thought that needs a prune. I'll have to look <laughs> into how to do that. Absolutely <laughs> enormous. <laughs> and, I, and in fact it's grown enormous in the past month or so yeah. um, when I saw it after the winter it was quite bare and you could see the lovely structure of the branches um, and of course now it's all green and huge um, so the the rule of thumb and this is too late for us I'll have to do it next year is that the fig should be pruned in early spring after the frosts have gone um, and then you can do some summer pruning to pinch back new uh, shoot tips to five or six leaves. Um, but if you do the summer pruning, then you will um, reduce the amount of fruit possibly um, that you get off it. But to be honest, when you're pruning, sometimes you have to make that sacrifice that you know that if you do the pruning this year, you'll get the results next year on this year's work. So, you know, I. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, the, the other thing that will happen is it will then grow again and it will produce a lot of side shoots from the leaf axle so it will get more bushy. Um, and these will, uh, they should overwinter. So I'm just looking at my notes on this one. They should overwinter. But again, if you get a really hard frost, you may find that those um, are affected by the frost. So again, going back to the spring pruning, then you would take out any damaged material anyway, um, and then you just thought you just get the the new shoots coming. We should get the new shoots coming from the spring. Um, yeah, it it's, can be quite a big job to prune the things back. I, I, and if you're worried, the other thing I would suggest, if you've got a fig tree and you're not quite sure. 
and this is general rule of thumb for any pruning, just do a part of it rather than the whole plant. It does stress the plant out sometimes if you if it's big and you take it out by more than a third, um, it might suffer. So maybe do a section at a time or a part of it um, that, that you don't mind losing if it, if it fails. But yeah, you could try that. It's probably quite a good idea, just kind of, it sounds like a pilot working out how it affects, like a test and then yeah. and see how the rest of the plant survives. Um, so our next question is um, is a historical question, um, and it's what are some bulbs and flowers that were common in Jane Austen's day and that she was familiar with? Are there any that would grow nicely in Zone Nine B? Um, which, for those who are unfamiliar with that, with that, which in includes me, um, is an explanation. It's hot and dry, then wet and cool here in my area of Northern California. So a little different to Hampshire. Um, I would love to plant an area of my garden that's specifically devoted to flowers that Jane Austen would have known and loved. Um, now, my uh, knowledge is that, that Jane Austen would have known kind of English meadow flowers, which might um, might be a little bit difficult to, to grow in a, in a very different climate. Um, but I think you've done quite a bit of research around this, around other flowers that um, were popular um, in the sort of Regency era that might survive in a in a non Hampshire climate. Yeah, I think um, as you've said, there's a lot of the native uh, flowers from from Britain, which um, we would probably um, expect to see in Jane Austen's garden. Um, the classification of plants had already started in the 1750s, so we were starting to see more hybridisation of plants, but not a huge amount. So many have been derived from the native British ones. Um, looking at North Carolina, again, I mean, it's quite interesting to see um, what a lot of the organisations have to say in that um, some of the plants that have grown over here were taken into North Carolina, um, for example, cornflowers, and are actually invasive now really? in the area. Um, I did see some photos of blue cornflowers absolutely everywhere. So <laughs> you have to be really, really careful um, because the non-native plants, they don't want to encourage um, a bit like we don't. And in fact, some of them, because they are so invasive, um, have been banned. Um, so just be really, really careful. Um, if you are thinking about recreating the Jane Austen garden, just do a bit of checking first. But what I have come up with is a, a very simple list um, to start with. So crocus is a particular woodland crocus uh, among the first bulbs to bloom. Um, something like bars purple or ruby giant, they're lovely. Um, there is the snowdrops, um, which obviously we have lots of over here. I'm not sure how well they grow in North Carolina where it's not woodland. So again, it depends on where your garden is, how much woodland you, and shade you've got. And they won't grow in like full sun. Um, daffodils, they seem to grow really well over there. Um, Carlton is a good one that's recommended and tete-a-tete. Um, very prolific. They don't naturalise um, perhaps as they do in the UK, but you can get some naturalisation of them. Aquilegias or columbines, which is the common name, um, yeah, absolutely would be a Jane Austen plant that I would suggest. I think she writes a bit because they're known as Granny's Bonnets, aren't they? That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. One, one she does write in a letter about, about having seen, so yes. Yeah. Yeah, and they like to seed everywhere, so they're, they're really good. Um, hollyhocks, another one she probably would have seen. Um, old fashioned roses. There is one which I found um, called Banksia, which is very pro prolific. We have that here at Chawton, it grows on the side of the house. Um, lovely, it's small yellow flowers, double flowers. Um, and apparently that will do quite well in. Um, North Carolina as well so that's yes, really because it's on the south side of the house isn't it so it's on yeah. that pot um, yeah. 
that kind of sunny side of the of the house. Yeah, it does need a lot of room though. So um, if it's happy, it will go mad. Um, <laughs> and, prune it. and the unusual thing about the bank series, it's not like the other roses that we would prune in February or March. You prune it after flowering, and it stays evergreen as well. Um, so that that that's quite a nice one to have. Um, and then the only other suggestion I had was you could have some um, lavender, but if you grow it in pots, oh, um, right. and then have like a little arrangement maybe of pots and herbs. Um, I'm thinking of the herb garden as well, because what we have in our herb garden is what would probably have been around at the time of Jane Austen as well. Excellent. So there's plenty of ideas there, um, mm -hmm. but don't, don't import something that's been banned. Or yes. <laughs> It's I don't want to have that responsibility. <laughs> We've not stressed that enough. <laughs> um, our next question, and, and I apologise if my, uh, Julie, you may have to correct my pronunciation of this, um, but it is, um, hi Julia, I've managed to grow some Ipamoea heavenly blue seedlings. Should I pinch one of the shoots? Um, you might have to explain what the plant is and maybe say it correctly if I've absolutely mangled that. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those difficult ones to say, and I'm not even sure I can say it. <laughs> I'm not I'm that for a Lancaster. <laughs> I'd say, somebody else may say, oh, it's not that. Um, <laughs> the, easy, the easy name, the common name is Morning Glory. Um, oh, right, well, I know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely blue flower. Um, so, um, and funnily enough, and I have a prop ah. I around in front of the screen here. This, this oh, is yeah. one that I've grown. Excellent. It's exactly what's been talked about, morning glory. Oh, and um, it's got a very long, try not to, very long stem there. Oh, I can see, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's also got some little shoots. If you can see those little yeah. shoots at the sides. Yeah. So, um, the advice that on this is you could treat it like a sweet pea so with sweet peas you will normally pinch the top out and then you get the bushiness from the little side shoots and then gradually as the plant gets bigger you get more and more shoots coming up so you can do that um, equally you can keep it as a single stem if you wanted to um, and that will grow nice and tall and you can wind that quite nicely around um, some trellis or something um, so my answer to that is do again do what you feel you like to do if you've got many of them then maybe do some pinch date and leave the rest um, I don't think there's a right or wrong particularly with these a bit like sweet peas you know so, some specialist growers will just have a single stem um, yeah. so you know it, yeah entirely up to you you, really. as you like on that one yeah <laughs> Um, I think a lot of people can um, sympathise with this next question. One of my rose bushes that I planted this year is just refusing to grow. It stayed short and stumpy and leafing out to the sides, but not up at all. Any tips to help it grow? I've only now got the first buds on my others. Yes. Um, right. So this one, um, we think, having had a little bit of a debate uh, with one of my volunteers about this um, <laughs> we think it's possibly a root problem maybe that it was pot found um, and then the roots either haven't been teased out or the ground is too hard to clay like or something that's just stopping those roots expanding um, and so um, that restricted planting pocket is not allowing the rose to sort of start to grow up the, the new stems. It just has not got the energy it to do it. Kind of in a way. <laughs> yeah, in a way, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it might be a question of soil. Um, it might be a problem with the rose itself. Uh, it's very difficult to say without having seen it. Um, the suggestion would be dig it out, have a look at the roots if they've not grown. Um, or they're restricted and then if there's a problem with the plant itself take it back to the nursery and just get them to have a look at it um, and again you could also just take a photo of it go to the nursery that you bought it from and see what they say as well 
quite often if you bought it somewhere reputable you'll have a guarantee with it um, so I think that's probably the best thing to do. Excellent. Um, our next question uh, is, oh, this is another another Regency plant. I have a myrtle plant, myrtle variegatus, a myrtle variegatus in 160 centimetre, six inch, hmm, I think it might be uh, six, 160 millimetres pot, which is situated hmm. against an east facing wall in a sheltered position. It's very healthy and currently 350 centimetres and 15 inches high. Um, in winter, I cover it with fleece as being in the foothills of the Pennines in West Yorkshire. Excellent. A good northern question here. I'm <laughs> the Pennines, but um, we do get some cold winters. Um, it was last repotted in April 2018. What I want to know is whether I should repot it again in a larger pot or leave it longer in the existing pot. So um, planted pots, containers are always tricky. A uh, general rule of thumb is um, you would normally repot something every two to three years, purely because the soil that's in the container has, has lost all the nutrient by then. So the plant is probably um, getting a little bit hungry. It's, got, it's not got anything to get any nutrients from because it's in the pot. So apart from feeding it and top dressing it, it's not going to get other nutrient. Um, you could repot it um, in a slightly bigger pot every two to three years just to make sure that you're teasing out any of the old soil and compost from the roots and then it will have all nice new compost to grow in for another couple of years. Um, that's what I would suggest. Um, with myrtle, again, the soil mix, it must be lime free. Um, is quite specific about what, what conditions it likes. Um, it obviously sounds very happy, so obviously whoever's growing <laughs> um, knows what they're doing. Um, and there's a suggestion that if you feed it with um, a rich potash feed, then you'll get more flowers, um, which obviously will be lovely. And it's ideal for the courtyard or a uh, small garden. Excellent. Um, good to have a question from the West Pennines. Oh. Um, that's where I'm from, for those who <laughs> don't recognise the accents. Um, and the, our last two questions we've we've put together because they were actually quite similar. Um, so um, they are your really your list of top native British plants for a home cottage garden um, that might be ideal for birds and and bees and pollinators. Um, and the, the other question was, I just wondered what kind of plants you use to attract butterflies at Chorton. Now, there's, 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 there could be quite a, a substantial list for, for both of these, uh, both of these. But I know you've had a you've had a quick think about what you what, what, what you would answer to both of those. Yeah, you're right. It's um, it, the list could go on and on. I could be here for the rest of the day, but obviously we're going to be running out of time soon. Um, so. Um, Yes, I think it's about, in an ideal cottage garden, it's thinking about flowers for each season because um, bees will come out when it's warm. Um, they could be flying around uh, February, March, and they could be flying until October, November. You want to make sure that you've got as wide a range of flowers as, as possible. Um, there are other insects as well that will pollinate. So you've got to think about beetles, flies, wasps and hoverflies. Um, they're out at different times as well, so they need nectar. Um, mix of hedges and trees uh, for birds, providing protection and food from the berries in the winter. So if you've got a small garden, maybe a small apple tree, which has the blossom, um, which will attract the bees, and then they need, obviously, the flowers around as well. Um, Single flowers are best for bees rather than the doubles. Um, some hybrid flowers don't have particularly good nectar sources uh, for pollinators. It's easier for them to get into it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, and also when you're thinking about buying plants, you can find on the labels now a lot more. And also if you're buying seeds on the websites, you'll find that there will be a little logo that said it's good for pollinators. 
So you can go through and select uh, plants that are particular, ones that you like, obviously, but ones that are good for, for pollinators. So that's really helpful now uh, because there are so many plants. Um, to answer the question about what do we have here, I mean, I'm still finding out. I'm only six months <laughs> in. Um, You've been here six months um, and I've been at Chilton just over a year. So I think we're both discovering new, new yeah. plants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so what I've seen so far here, um, is, there's obviously lots of bulbs in the spring. So we've got the bluebells and the crocus. They're particularly good. The hedges, uh, trees, hawthorn um, is really good. We've had primroses um, in the spring. Then the rosemary. Well, the rosemary has been buzzing with bees for ages. It's, we we grow our rosemary plants are prolific they are enormous yeah. they're both yeah. in front of the house in the herb garden yeah they are yeah. they do very well in at yeah. Oh, yeah and that that's been the key really is i stand in the garden and i listen to the buzzing and i sort of think well where's that coming from <laughs> you know and it's the apple trees were, were just full of it um but as we move into the summer we're starting to see the lupines the peter, especially in the herbaceous borders, the bees are just smothering that. Um, roses, obviously, they like particularly single flowers, which I mentioned. Um, the foxgloves, we've got some of those, and they sort of go in the little trumpet flowers. Hardy geraniums, um, because they last for quite a long time, and they start early in the season as well. Um, and the dahlias, which we will be uh, seeing later in the year. So we already do have quite a good selection um, and I want to develop that some more because I want to make sure that we do have enough pollinating plants for as much of the season as possible. So I'm going to be looking at like winter honeysuckle, uh, maybe some clematis and developing the cut flower garden so that we can have more eryngium and echinox which are like spiky blue and the bees absolutely love those, I've seen that before. Um, uh, cornflowers, amimagus, which is a lovely white um, soft flower. Um, you know, there's just so much, but really the case of just think about again what you like, what colours you like, what your garden um, soil is like, um, and then have a good look through seed, seed lists. I mean, we have, in January when it's all dark and you've got you know, nothing else to do possibly <laughs> get the seed catalogue out and start making a list. That, yeah. That's probably the and best way to do it. Really is no, as a as a as I said, a novice gardener, um you can make mistakes as long as you as long as you don't plant anything kind of invasive or illegal. Yeah, um, yeah. then you know it's the, what's the worst that can happen. Yeah. So have a have an experiment and see what works in your own in your own particular garden, whether that's Hampshire, North Carolina the West Pennines or anywhere else, anywhere yeah. else in between. Yeah. Julia, thank you so much for answering so many questions. Um, I've learned a lot um, and I hope the people watching this um, as part of the Garden Festival um, will have done as well. And we hope that we can both welcome visitors back to Chilton House Gardens um, in person very soon. Definitely, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Bye. See you soon.